Hello, Working Preachers. This is Joy J. Moore. Our fall campaign is in full swing, but we still need your help to reach our goal before November 30th. We're celebrating Working Preacher as a community of imagination this week. I'm grateful for writers, actors, musicians, and well, those people who allow me to pretend that I am one of those persons. I've appreciated the patterns of being able to be creative, whether trying to repeat what I've seen in art or trying to describe with words the awesomeness of what it means to experience God and put it in words. Those people in my life are the kinds of people that make me the preacher I am. You can make your gift to the fall campaign in honor or memory of someone who supports you in your faith journey. I can't wait to see who you honor with your generosity to Working Preacher. And thank you to every one of you who have given so generously already. You can go to workingpreacher.org today to make your gift. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. The 25th Sunday after Pentecost falls on November 19th, 2023. And these are the texts. Zephaniah, chapter 1, verses 7, and then 12 through 18. I'm told that's an Old Testament book. It is. It is. <laughs> Zephaniah's big day on the stage. Uh, it, or you can read Judges 4, 1 through 7. That's just after Joshua, in case you're looking for it. Uh, or the Psalm, Psalm 90, 1 through 8, maybe 9 through 11, definitely verse 12. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 11, and Matthew 25, 14 through 30. Happy, happy <laughs> reign of Christ, Christ the King Eve service. Second to last Sunday of the year. Yeah, yeah. And Thanksgiving is coming. That's right. Yeah, which means that uh, once we have our reading from Matthew for next week, Christ the King, we are we have completed year A. We have also moved through our alternate Old Testament reading part of the year. So yeah, yeah, we're it's time up. to get the decorations out. Yeah, we're coming up on a big change here, and then our last reading from First Thessalonians. Our second parable, however, of Matthew twenty-five. We yeah, keep... parable of the talents. This one's uh, this one's we a hit. All right, Matt, what do you have to say about that? Well, I I, I think I put writing... my cards on the table. What you've been writing a book about Matthew? So I have. Uh... I have a book on Matthew coming out in April. It will solve you all the problems. Unfortunately, yeah. I have to wait till <laughs> April. Yeah, darn. <laughs> Just in time for Easter during Year B. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> I mentioned this last week. This is part of a longer discourse that spans chapters 24 through 25. Jesus is addressing his disciples. He's talking about horrific times ahead when the world is falling apart and when there's persecution and horribleness and he won't be around, but he has already promised to be among us. He'll do that again in chapter 28, but he's got work to do. He has ministry to do. He's commissioned people into ministry. And so I take this parable in its quote unquote traditional sense, which is this is emblematic of Jesus entrusting mm -hmm. responsibilities, I would say even privileges and an influence on his followers and says, go do the kind of work I've been doing. Now, I know a lot of people look at this and they think eh, it's about enslavement. I don't really like that. It's about uh, there's kind of a, a capitalistic element to this of like using lots of money to make even more money. That's not what the kingdom is like. The kingdom of God is not a capitalist enterprise. I don't think our relationship to God is akin to enslavement in a number of ways. But you got to walk into the ancient into the ancient world, and in the ancient world, there were lots of stories about powerful people who entrusted their underlings to do things on their behalf, and that was kind of a test of character. It was kind of the trope, and I think Jesus is doing a common trope, not to say, hey, guess what? I'm like this hot-headed master, but he's saying, 
<laughs> you have been given opportunities to do stuff in the world that's going to be transformative, not to dominate, but to carry on the blessed are statements from the Beatitudes. Uh, and so don't bury that in the ground. Yeah. Damn it, I think is what he says. That got edited out by early manuscript. I, so it goes back to last week. Who's going to pay a price for your fear and inaction? And it's not you're going to pay a price. I mean, that's part of the parable I recognize, but it's also <laughs> uh, uh, mercy pays a price, right? Uh, when a church gets lazy, when a church gets self-satisfied, it's the people who need mercy who suffer. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I'm done. Should we go on to Zephaniah? <laughs> <laughs> well, the uh, yes, I, I yes, what you what you said, uh, Matt, and I I think again when you put it in the context of the everything that we've been saying and the the fact that we're you know we're we're coming up on on the end of Jesus public ministry you're you're right the scribes probably edited out damn it but that's probably what Jesus said I was like come on people this is I'm and that's that, and so, you know, I look at the 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 translation of the word property. I mean that that translation, and um, but it's 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 really um, it's uh, all the things I have uh, or all the things that are. Um, it's a it's a verb there, and all the things I possess. So it's. It's it's really kind of an all encompassing uh, word there that is that is meant to I think uh, it, that really is meant to kind of recall everything uh, that that Jesus has done and that Jesus has talked about when it comes to uh, when it comes to the kingdom so that the kingdom is is really the mission of God's you know, the mission of God's kingdom. That's what that word is. And so what are you, what are you going to do with it? And the preacher then, again, we've, we've been doing this for weeks, but going back to the Beatitudes, what are you going to do with that light? Or, you know, the Sermon on Mount, what are you going to do with that? You are the salt. Um, and, and you, and you can't bury it. You just can't, you can't, there's too much at stake. <laughs> there's way too much at stake. And uh, so, yeah, that's now there's a, thoughts. Yeah, there's a um uh I I can't remember where I got this from. I've been saying it so long, I think it's my own, but I do think somebody said it to me. Um, but uh it was a recognition of what is the mission of God. And this mission of God uh looks like the kingdom, it looks like justice, it looks like blessing for others, it looks like good in the midst of those who haven't seen it. And that raises the question, does the mission of God have a church, have a community, have people that will live it out? And so, yeah, I think that this uh, is a text that is, is a hard text, as are each of the texts this week, because it is asking whether or not we are going to do the work that we were created to, to do, um, a, a work and I am trying to echo some of the texts that we've read uh, in the in the last few weeks, a work that we were created to do as image bearers of God, a work that we said yes to, as uh, the Israelites did before uh, Joshua and before Moses. Uh, and we said yes to when we said, I will be a Christian. Well, the this great work has been entrusted to us. And I think that um, in the season that we're currently living in, we preachers have a responsibility to really challenge our folks to hear this word as an invitation to us that has, as you've said, mad consequences if we do not take it. Yeah. And I want to be clear, the consequences are for others. I mean, it's right. In the book, I say the mission is mercy. That's the church's mission. And Jesus is so frustrated in Matthew's gospel by religious traditions or ideas or people who get in the way of the blessings God desires to pour out on those who need them. So I don't know how to explore that. I think it, it, part of the parable should help us 
be sickened by false forms of religion or maybe false forms is maybe not the right word, but like <laughs> just um, damage, you know, uh, damaging or uncaring or just, I keep going back to the word self-satisfied form yeah. of religion, you know, yeah. which isn't to say there's not a role for just enjoying being together and worshiping and things like that. But what's, what is your purpose? Yeah. Yeah. And Can I think I, this is an opportunity. I think this is an opportunity to acknowledge um, the variety of, of persons that bring different gifts to um uh, to the church. So mm -hmm. we're not just looking for a music leader, or we're not just looking for a Sunday school teacher. We're not just looking for someone that will make what we do on Sunday or in this particular facility successful. We are talking about the many, the distribution of the many talents that um, will be lived out as a cashier in a grocery store or a barista at a coffee shop or uh, a, a cop on the corner or a, a teacher in a classroom. You know, that list of you've been given a talent and it doesn't matter whether society thinks it's a big amount or a small amount. The responsibility of that is to be a display of the grace of God. And I would want us to read this corporately as well, that maybe he's not talking about so much, you're a horrible individual who's not doing enough, but rather maybe this is a community. Absolutely. Maybe there are some days I bury my talent, other days I don't. You know, there's a, there's a binary here in the parable that's there for emphasis that I might want to interrogate a bit, but um, it's a good point, right? It's not just about you have to do everything and spend, you know, right. 24 hours a day, um, you know, deeply committed to something. Yeah. So don't sleep, don't eat, don't take care of yourself. The parable is not saying that, I don't think. No, it's, it's also interesting that the responsibility. There's yeah, actually I'm a sorry. command that says something about resting on purpose. <laughs> well, and the 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 privileges here are parceled out according to one's own ability. Exactly. Which yeah. could be seen as unfair or elitist, but I think it's also a kind of statement that. Everybody has a different capacity for what they're positioned to do and don't sweat that. Although at the end, Jesus does say, whoever's got all the talents can have more, <laughs> but mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not saying the parable behaves perfectly. There's but, always uh, a parable. Mm -hmm. But I think, I think I, I, I would invite uh, our listeners to convey the, um, uh, the diversity um, not just in terms of amount. Um, so when we think of folks that are, are uh, particularly talented uh, in those unique areas like um, uh, art or um, uh, uh, um, uh, poetry or, or singing, that's, that's what I'm, I'm trying to get to, musicians playing or, or, or singing, um, we don't all expect to be able to be able to sing outside of our shower. We will sing privately, but there are a few folks, a few folks who have that particular gift. And um, so one way of looking at that is that that's a small amount in the community of faith. And yet um, it's not insignificant, uh, you know, that what you do is just this should never be the way it's described just this should never be uh, the modifier for it um yeah. and then that would allow us to take the individual and put them back into a community uh if you're um if you're having a hard time finding zephaniah just go to haggai and it's right before that <laughs> I, it's, I call it the sleepy end of <laughs> the um the, you just sort of go hmm yeah mm. Uh, yeah. Or Caroline, uh, you might be in Habakkuk, and if so, just turn a few more pages, and you'll yep. find you'll find Zephaniah. There. Yeah, this is the yeah, this is one of those moments where you, if, if there are a few in our <laughs> podcasting where we go Zephaniah. Wow, yeah. Don't confuse just, it with Zechariah either. That would be embarrassing. No, didn't didn't remember that that was in the. 
was in the Bible. You got that H Z M Z, and it, you just sort of just sort of sleepy toward the end. Yeah. Somewhere wow. Rolf is cringing right now. He doesn't yeah. hear this. It is somewhere his whole body is seizing up right crazy now. All the listeners out there, don't tell him. <laughs> don't you don't dare him. email him and tell do, him that do we. Not, do not. <laughs> We made this, fun of Zephaniah. Yeah. This text is saying the same thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, we've we've talked about this mission of God. Um, here we were talking about Jesus sending out uh, disciples that will carry on his work. Um, um, these words coming just before he's going to leave his earthly ministry, except for what Jesus has done is an, and asking his disciples to do is a continuation of what God has always been doing and has always asked the people of God to do. And um, so uh, as you were speaking, um, Matt, about how we do worship, I think that was you. Sorry. One of you said this <laughs> about how we do worship. Uh, that's what uh, Zephaniah is. Uh, that That's what the prophets are doing very often. And that is particularly what Zephaniah is doing here. But what I would lift up for this context um, before we talk about uh, the consequences that God is going to uh, put upon uh, God's people is verse 17 is the why. This distress will be brought upon the people um, that they shall walk in like the blind. And here's the part, because they have sinned against the Lord. So this is why there is a reason. This is not some random act of God. This is the consequences of having ignored the words of the prophet and ignored the task of the people to practice justice, to not just have these worship services, these great sacrifices of finding the unblemished lamb, but because of those sacrifices, to live as glimpses of the grace and mercy of God. And that's what the people have not done. And to that, they will be held accountable. Ouch. Yep. Yep. Who rest complacently on their dregs. Ouch. I love that image. I don't know what it means, but I love that image. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. It's a good question, right? Like who does, what comes to your mind when you think of what it means to rest complacently? Not rest, but rest complacently. What's com- mm-hmm. In what mm-hmm. way is complacency the enemy of mercy? Ah, huh. there are no consequences. Yeah. I can be complacent because there are no consequences. Yeah. Interestingly enough, uh, 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 Peter talks in this way too uh, in the in the epistles. Uh, this sense of well, if nothing's going to happen. It, you know, if if God is not going to do anything, that's the next verse after this yeah. complacency on the dregs. Mm-hmm. What's well, a good point? Jesus says nothing that's not any scarier than things that the prophets say. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> In terms of, yeah. Um, yeah, which doesn't make it easier to stomach, right? But it's it, you know, it, it should also break open the whole Old Testament is mean God, New Testament is nice God dichotomy yeah. that some people live with. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, but it's that. Yeah, I I think that is the way in which you bring in how do we understand what complacency is. Um, And I really like that, Matt, is that to what extent that's the opposite of mercy, Uh, because complacency is that sort of it's a self-satisfaction that you don't need mercy. (laughs) Um, And so, yeah, I think I, I think the Zephaniah text can add a lot to. Um, to ways in which we imagine what does it mean not to not to carry out the mission of mm-hmm. the mission of the kingdom mm-hmm. so and if we want, might even go ahead sorry joy uh, okay um, <laughs> if we want to read this in in uh, in an anachronistic way of capitalism this really hurts to read because what will be lost is their wealth that all that has been accumulated because they have not been practicing mercy, because they have been participants in the oppression of other, because they have gathered for themselves and left others without, that will be taken away from them as a consequence 
of their complacency. So I love that idea, Matt, that the mm-hmm. opposite of mercy is complacency. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it might even be an, an active force against mercy. Complacency might, yeah. you know what I mean? That yeah. it actively tries to prohibit it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, to that's gain, good. To gain for myself. Yeah, exactly. And that, you know, you don't, you, you're pretty, you're pretty, you're pretty self-satisfied. So why do you need anything? <laughs> um, yeah, that's great. Uh, judges, this is it. The end of the semi-continuous reading. And there's an appearance <laughs> of judges and that, that opening line, which is repeated throughout of, uh, the, 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 the narrative of judges. Israelite, the Israelites again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. If you dare to read all of judges, uh, and do what Caroline did, uh, a week ago in terms of cir- circling in Joshua, how often serve is, is repeated. Um, the, uh, how often the Israelites did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Um, it, it shows up in Judges. It's, it's repeated after the judge dies, after the one who restored them to looking toward God or the one who enabled them to see what this generation had not seen, the acts of God in their lifetime. What do they do? They do evil in, in the sight of the Lord. But um, I, I, I like uh, reminding my students that um, this, um, this particular passage is uh, uh, about a woman. And, and so in this short series of Judges, which is way too long than we'd like for it to read, a woman makes an appearance. And she makes an appearance despite how the English translations translated. She makes an appearance as a judge. She makes an appearance as a prophet. And uh, the story here is absolutely incredible and I think uh, uh, deserves paying attention to because uh, the whole of the story is um, that um, she she says to Barack that um, um, that uh, that uh, I can tell you you're going to win this uh, battle. And it goes on um, where it's a woman that gets the victory. But you have to read it closely to recognize you can't skim over it. Another woman is going to show up, and that's J.L. And she's the one that gets the victory. It's not Deborah. So in this book of Judges, that women show up repeatedly. And just while I'm on this woman kick, um, the next book that is the book of Ruth is in the same time period. So in the time of the judges, we're going to have repeated stories of Deborah, of JL, of of women that are part of the warring group, and then women who are part of the community, which will be Ruth, uh, uh, Naomi and Ruth, and uh, Orpah. Uh, And and so I I just wanted to, to highlight that. Uh, yeah. in this very difficult passage. So now we can get back to the difficultness of it. No, I was going to highlight that too, uh, Joy. So I'm so glad you brought that up. I mean, the, uh, characters like this are so infrequent um, <laughs> in in our scripture, but um, also, you know, the fact that as the commentary points out, this is the only passage from the book of Judges that appears in the Revised Common Lectionary. So unless you're going to veer off and say, I'm going to do a sermon series on Judges, nobody's going to ever hear, nobody's ever going to hear about these women characters. And so I, and I've been doing this podcast for a long time. So my, uh, our listeners know that, that I am always of the inclination to uh, lift up. This is an opportunity to lift up Deborah, to lift up JL, uh, to lift up these uh, such important persons in the history of Israel and, and their relationship with God. And, uh, and so you, you, that, for me, that's the whole sermon is to lift up her, lift up her, and lift up her role, and and the way in which she enters into a time that's really important in Israel's history. And so, and her yep, highest commander, and her highest commander, 
He says, I, 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 I won't go into battle. I won't, I won't go. I, you said we win, but uh, girlfriend, I won't go unless you go. You got to go with me. You got to yeah. go with me, girlfriend. Go with I, I, I love, this is. I ain't and, going alone. I ain't going alone. And, and it's the woman that he says. And the other interesting thing, both about the whole of the book of Judges, this particular chapter, uh, this particular judge, this particular episode, and the book of Ruth are actually Israel's faithfulness, which is characteristically opposite of the practices of the people of God in the rest of the book of Judges. The, the book, the chapter opens as throughout I opened and I said, the people do what is wicked in the sight of the Lord. But in the time of Judges, the women that are lifted up are the women who are faithful before God. Yeah. Caroline's not the only person that sees that. <laughs> <laughs> yep. That's Good. all great stuff. I'll just say you have to extend this into the, the end of chapter four. You just simply need to um, go camping yeah. with JL and yes. no, you'll never look at a tent peg again in the same way. Yeah. And <laughs> you might- Milk and cookies from. <laughs> you might even get, um, if you're uh, musically inclined or maybe you have people in your congregation, there might be a way to set the song of Deborah to some kind of a, a psalmic mm -hmm. yeah. is that a word a kind, of, <laughs> kind of a psalmic rhythm or something like that and, and create that. a poem for that i don't know if that's been done or not but that's in chapter five which is worth doing yeah, yeah that'd be great yeah. mm -hmm. whole service built around deborah i'm game yeah, i am too all right email us and tell us if you do that yes <laughs> anyway all right psalm 90 anything in particular here well, um, for me, I highlighted verse four, the familiar, the familiar verse, but I highlighted in this sense, um, uh, the, the uh, middle there, it says, when it is past, I'm, I'm reading it out of order, when it is past, a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday, or like a watch in the night, um, th that not looking at it as I confess, I've always looked at it as sort of just this blink in the eye idea. But um, in the context of God's faithfulness, in the context of, of God's willingness to uh, entrust humanity with the task that the other texts have brought out for us, um, it's like all of our sin is forgotten. Uh, it's like all of our failure is forgotten. And, and so the flash of a night, uh, the, 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 the flash of an eye, um, it, it, it reads differently for me when I'm reminding myself that once we get beyond God's anger, um, God's grace is so long. Well, I like the fact that the, the commentary, too, um, makes the connection of the paraphrase of Psalm 90 of the Isaac Watts hymn. So that's how I would use it. Yes. <laughs> I'd sing it. Sing some Isaac Watts. There you go. And now we're done with uh, Thessalonians. This is our oh, last mm -hmm. our last um, passage from walking through this book, this letter. So I'll tell you what stood out for me. Another line, um, partly because of the way I've, I've often heard this in, interpreted where it's an instruction um, it's very interesting that it opens up by saying, there's no need to give you any instruction here for you know, and you know that it's going to be like a thief in the night. You're not going to be ready for it. Um, I, that caught me in this particular sense, again, reminding our, our, our listeners that this is to, to remind their hearers that this is an early text of the New Testament. And this is when the expectation would, that Jesus was going to come uh, any moment now, literally, um, th that he says, I don't need to write you anything as I write you this um, because you already know. And it becomes important because something was written, because this letter was given. Um, it becomes important because the timing for Jesus' return was not as soon or as sudden as, it, as, as they thought. And here we are 2,000 years ago, able to benefit from that. So that's what stood out for me. 
Yeah. And it, the, what it promises, you mentioned this last week, is encouragement. I think it promises peace and security. And your congregation should know that that pox et securitas, this is a, this is a Roman, um, a bit of Roman propaganda, a Roman slogan about what does Rome provide to the world, peace and security. So Paul's, Paul's talking a little trash here. He is toward Rome and saying, you know, just when they th- just when they're telling you you're living in the best of all possible worlds, or just when they're telling you trust us, uh, that's when you know it's going to come crashing down. Now, in a way, that means Paul might have miscalculated or, or misimagined the return, but it's a way to make us, I think, drive us to where are the promises of peace and security coming from. How are those political? How are those economic, cultural, and and to see that. One of the things that the hope of Christ's return does is it undermines some of those those um, those counterfeit claims about where peace and security really really reside. And how yes, and how are those promises then uh, characteristic of how we encourage one another and build each other up? And the verb encourage can be translated exhort or to comfort. And the verb there actually is parakaleo. So it's, it's, uh, the, it's the noun form of what, um, you know, John oh, uses. Oh, yeah. Does John have something to say about that? Yeah, but I mean, I'm not, I'm not bringing John in, but I'm saying, you know, parakaleo literally means, and I think this would help people to think about what does it mean to encourage. Um, kaleo means to call and para is, along, is alongside. So um, be alongside one another. <laughs> uh, and paraclete can be translated encourage, encourager, comforter, aid, intercessor, advocate, helper, all of those things. And so I... Uh, so which really expands then what does it mean to be uh to to encourage one another and to build one each build each other up with what words and with what uh and with what promises that we know are and uh, because of uh, the death and resurrection of Jesus and so it's i think it's a lovely it, it's a it's a lovely image and it's an important one as we think about what does it mean to be a community of Christ and Um, And the community of Christ means that we are called to be alongside each other in those words of encouragement and hope.